Book Two, Chapter One of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Two, Pendle Forest, Chapter One, Flint. A lovely morning succeeded the strange and terrible night. Brightly shone the sun upon the fair Calder, as it winded along the green meads above the bridge, as it rushed rejoicingly over the weir, and pursued its rapid course through the broad plain below the abbey. A few white vapours hung upon the summit of Whaley Nab, but the warm rays tinging them with gold, and tipping them with fire, the tree-tops that pierced through them augured their speedy dispersion. So beautiful, so tranquil looked the old monastic fane, that none would have deemed its midnight rest had been broken by the impious rites of a foul troop. The choir, where the unearthly screams and demon laughter had resounded, was now vocal with the melodies of the blackbird, the thrush, and other songsters of the grove. Bells of dew glittered upon the bushes rooted in the walls, and upon the ivy-grown pillars and gemming the countless spiders' webs stretched from bough to bough, showed they were all unbroken. No traces were visible on the sod where the unhallowed crew had danced their round, nor were any ashes left where the fire had burned and the cauldron had bubbled. The brass-covered tombs of the abbots in the presbytery looked as if a century had passed over them without disturbance, while the graves in the cloister cemetery obliterated, and only to be detected when a broken coffin or a mouldering bone was turned up by the tiller of the ground, preserved their wonted appearance. The face of nature had received neither impress nor injury from the fantastic freaks and necromantic exhibitions of the witches. Everything looked as if it was left overnight, and the only footprints to be detected were those of the two girls, and of the party who came in quest for them. All else had passed by like a vision or a dream. The rooks cawed loudly in the neighbouring trees, as if discussing the question of breakfast, and the jackdaws wheeled merrily round the tall spire, which sprang from the eastern end of the fane. Brightly shone the sun upon the noble timber embowering the mansion of the Ashertons, upon the ancient gateway, in the upper chamber of which Ned Huddleston, the porter, and the burly representative of Friar Tuck was rubbing his sleepy eyes, preparatory to habiting himself in his ordinary attire, and upon the wide courtyard, across which Nicholas was walking in the direction of the stables. Notwithstanding his excesses overnight, the squire was astir, as he had declared he should be before daybreak, and a plunge into the calder had cooled his feverish limbs and cured his racking headache, while a draught of ale set his stomach right. Still, in modern parlance he looked rather seedy, and his recollection of the events of the previous night was somewhat confused. Aware he had committed many fooleries, he did not desire to investigate matters too closely, and only hoped he should not be reminded of them by Sir Ralph, or, worse still, by Parson Dewhurst. As to his poor, dear, uncomplaining wife, he never once troubled his head about her, feeling quite sure she would not upbraid him. On his appearance in the courtyard, the two noble bloodhounds and several lesser dogs came forward to greet him, and attended by this noisy pack, he marched up to a groom who was rubbing down his horse at the stable door. "'Poor Robin!' he cried to the steed, who neighed at his appearance. "'Poor Robin!' he said, patting his neck affectionately. "'There is not thy match for speed or endurance, for fence or ditch, for beck or stone wall in the country.' Half an hour on thy back will make all right with me, but I would rather take thee to Boland Forest and hunt the stag there than go and perambulate the boundaries of the rough Lee estates with a rascally attorney. I wonder how the fellow will be mounted. If you'll be spearing about Mr. Potts, squire, observed the groom, I can tell you, is to our little flint the Welsh pony. By zounds, you don't say so, Peter, exclaimed Nicholas, laughing. "'He'll never be able to manage him. "'Flint's the wickedest and most wilful little brute I ever knew. "'We shall have Master Potts run away with him, or thrown into a moss-pit. "'Better give him something quieter.' "'It's a Ralph's orders,' 
replied Peter, and I durna disobey em. But Flint's far steadier than when you seed him last, squire. But Darcy will carry Master Potts will enough if he doesn't mislead him. You think nothing of the sort, Peter, said Nicholas. You expect to see the little gentleman fly over the pony's head and perhaps break his own at starting. But if Sir Ralph has ordered it, he must be abide by the consequences. I shan't interfere further. How goes the young colt you were breaking in? You should take care to show him the saddle in the manger. Let him smell it, and jingle the stirrups in his ears before you put it on his back. Better ground for his first lessons could not be desired than the field below the grange, near the calder. Sir Ralph was saying yesterday that the roan mare had pricked her foot. You must wash the sore well with white wine and salt, rub it with the ointment the farriers call Egypticum, and then put upon it hot plaster, compounded of flax heart, turpentine, oil and wax, made in the top of the hoof with ball armagnac and vinegar. This is the best and quickest remedy. And recollect, Peter, that for a new strain, vinegar, ball armagnac, whites of egg and bean flour make the best salve. Now goes on Sir Ralph's black charger, dragon. Brave horse that, Peter, and the only one in your master's all stood to compare with my robin. The dragon, though of high courage and great swiftness, has not the strength and endurance of robin, neither can he leap so well. Why, robin would almost clear the colder, Peter, and make nothing of Smithy's brook near Downham, and you know how wide that stream is. I once tried him at the Ribble, at a narrow point, and if a horse could have done it, he would. "'but there was too much to expect.' "'Oh, great deal, I should say, squire,' replied the groom, opening his eyes to their widest extent. "'Why, ribble where you speak on mummy twenty yards across, if it be an inch, and no nag as ever work could clear that, unless a witch were on his back.' "'Don't allude to witches, Peter,' said Nicholas. "'I've had enough of them. But to come back to our steeds, Colour is a matter of taste, and a man must please his own eye with bay or grey, chestnut, sorrel, or black, but done is my fancy. A good horse, Peter, should be clean-limbed, short-jointed, strong hooves, out-ribbed, broad-chested, deep-necked, loose-throttled, thin-crested, lean-headed, full-eyed, and with wide nostrils. A horse with half these points would not be wrong, and Robin has them all. Oh, so he has, sure enough, squire replied peter regarding the animal with an approving eye as nicholas enumerated his merits boy far may choose betwixt em and young master richard tasherton's grey geld in merlin our nose which our deck robin the course said nicholas nay squire it should be t'other replied the groom you're no judge of a horse peter rejoined nicholas shrugging his shoulders oh maybe not said the groom but I'm bound to speak truth. I say, Tun Lomox is bringing out Merlin. We can put the two nags side by side, if you choose. They shall be put side by side in the field, Peter. That's the way to test their respective merits, returned Nicholas. And they won't remain long together, I warrant you. I offered to make a match for twenty pieces with Master Richard, but he declined the offer. Harky, Peter, brick an egg in Robin's mouth before you put on his bridle. It strengthens the wind, and adds to horses' power of endurance. Do you understand? Perfectly, squire, replied the groom. By the mess, that's a sacred worth knowing. Any more orders? No, replied Nicholas. We shall set out in an hour, or it may be sooner. Or some be ready, said Peter. And he added to himself, as Nicholas moved away, Oh, take care, Tom Lomax, give us an egg to Merlin, and that'll make all fair, for if they chance to tie their osses metal. As Nicholas returned to the house, he perceived to his dismay Sir Ralph and Parson Dewhurst standing upon the steps, and convinced from their grave looks that they were prepared to lecture him, he endeavoured to nerve himself for the infliction. Do to one an awkward odds, said the squire to himself, especially when they have the vantage ground. "'But I must face them, and make the best fight circumstances will allow. "'I shall never be able to explain that mad dance with his old Eton. "'No one but Dick will believe me, and the chances are he won't support my story. "'But I must put on an air of penitence, and, sooth to say, in my present state, "'it's not very difficult to assume.' 
thus pondering with slow step affectedly humble demeanour and surprisingly lengthened visage he approached the pair who were waiting for him and regarding him with severe looks thinking it the best plan to open the fire himself nicholas saluted them and said give you a good day sir ralph and you too worthy master dewhurst i scarcely expected to see you so early as stair good sirs but the morning is too beautiful to allow us to be sluggards for my own part i have been awake for hours and have passed the time early in self-reproaches for my folly and sinfulness last night as well as in forming resolutions for self-amendment and better government in future i hope you will adhere to those resolutions then nicholas rejoined sir ralph sternly for change of conduct is absolutely necessary if you would maintain your character as a gentleman i can make allowance for high animal spirits and can excuse some license though i do not approve of it but i will not permit decorum to be outraged in my house and suffer so ill an example to be set to my tenantry fortunately i was not present at the exhibition said dewhurst but i am told you conducted yourself like one possessed and committed such shrieks as are rarely if ever acted by a rational being i can offer no defence worthy sir and you my respected relative returned nicholas with a contrite air neither can you reprove me more strongly than i deserve nor than i upbraid myself i allowed myself to be overcome by wine and in that condition was undoubtedly guilty of follies i must ever regret amongst others i believe you stood upon your head remarked dewhurst i am not aware of the circumstances reverend sir replied nicholas with difficulty repressing a smile but as i certainly lost my head i may have stood upon it unconsciously but i do recollect enough to make me heartily ashamed of myself and determined to avoid all such excesses in future in that case sir rejoined dewhurst the occurrences of last night though sufficiently discreditable to you will not be without profit for i have observed to my infinite regret that you are apt to indulge in immoderate potations when under their influence to lose due command of yourself and commit follies which your sober reason must condemn at such times i scarcely recognize you you speak with unbecoming levity and even allow oaths to escape your lips it is true reverend sir said nicholas but the hounds are plague upon my tongue it is an unruly member forgive me good sir but my brain is a little confused i do not wonder from the grievous assaults made upon it last night nicholas observed sir ralph perhaps you are not aware that your crowning act was whisking wildly round the room by yourself like a frantic dervish i was dancing with his old eton said nicholas with whom inquired dewhurst in surprise with a wicked votaress who has been dead nearly a couple of centuries interposed sir ralph and who by her sinful life merited the punishment she is said to have incurred this delusion shows how dreadfully intoxicated you were nicholas for the time you had quite lost your reason i am sober enough now at all events rejoined nicholas and i am convinced that it all did dance with me nor will any arguments reason me out of that belief i am sorry to hear you say so nicholas returned sir ralph that you were under the impression at the time i can easily understand but that you should persist in such a senseless and wicked notion is more than i can comprehend i saw her with my own eyes as plainly as i see you sir ralph replied nicholas warmly that i declare upon my honour and conscience and i also felt the pressure of her arms whether it may not have been the fiend in her likeness i will not take upon me to declare indeed i have some misgivings on the subject but that a beautiful creature exactly remembering the votaress danced with me i will ever maintain if so she was invisible to others for i beheld her not said sir ralph and though i cannot yield credence to your explanation yet granting it to be correct i do not see how it mends your case on the contrary it only proves that master nicholas yielded to the snares of satan said dewhurst shaking his head 
"'I would recommend you long fasting and frequent prayer, my good sir, "'and I shall prepare a lecture for your special edification "'which I will propound to you on your return to Downham. "'And if it fails in effect, I will persevere with other godly discourses.' "'With your aid I trust to be set free, reverend sir,' returned Nicholas. "'But as I have already passed two or three hours in prayer, "'I hope they may stand me in lieu of any present fasting, "'and induce you to omit the article of penance, "'or postpone it to some future occasion, "'when I may be better able to perform it, "'for I am just now particularly hungry, "'and I am always better able to resist temptation "'with a full stomach than an empty one.' "'As I find it displeasing to Sir Ralph, "'I will not insist upon my visionary partner in the dance, "'at least until I am better able to substantiate the fact. "'And I shall listen to your lectures, worthy sir, with great delight, "'and I doubt not with equal benefit. "'But in the meantime, as Carl wants must be supplied, "'and mundane matters attended to, "'I propose, with our excellent host's permission, "'that we proceed to breakfast.' "'Sir Ralph made no answer, but ascended the steps.' and was followed by Dewhurst heaving a deep sigh, and turning up the whites of his eyes, and by Nicholas, who felt his bosom eased of half its load, and secretly congratulated himself upon getting out of the scrape so easily. In the hall they found Richard Asherton, habited in a riding-dress, booted, spurred, and in all respects prepared for the expedition. There were such evident traces of anxiety and suffering about him, that Sir Ralph questioned him as to the cause— and Richard replied that he had passed a most restless night. He did not add that he had been made acquainted by Adam Whitworth with the midnight visit of the two girls to the conventual church, because he was well aware Sir Ralph would be greatly displeased by the circumstance, and because Mistress Nutter had expressed a wish that it should be kept secret. Sir Ralph, however, saw there was more upon his young relative's mind than he chose to confess, but he did not urge any further admission into his confidence. Meantime the party had been increased by the arrival of Master Potts, who was likewise equipped for the ride. The hour was too early, it might be, for him, or he had not rested well like Richard, or had been troubled with bad dreams, but certainly he did not look very well, or in very good humour. He had slept at the abbey, having been accommodated with a bed, after the sudden seizure which he attributed to the instrumentality of Mistress Nutter. The little attorney bowed obsequiously to Sir Ralph, who returned his salutation very stiffly, nor was he much better received by the rest of the company. At a sign from Sir Ralph his guests then knelt down, and a prayer was uttered by the divine, or rather a discourse, for it partook more of the latter character than the former. In the course of it he took occasion to paint in strong colours the terrible consequences of intemperance, and Nicholas was obliged to endure a well-merited lecture of half an hour's duration. But even Parson Dewhurst could not hold out for ever, and to the relief of all his hearers he at length brought this discourse to a close. Breakfast at this period was a much more substantial affair than a modern morning repast, and differed little from dinner or supper, except in respect to quantity. On the present occasion there were carbonados of fish and fowl, a cold chine, a huge pasty, a capon, neat's tongues, sausages, botargos, and other matters as provocative of thirst as sufficing to the appetite. Nicholas set to work bravely. Boiled trout, steaks, and a huge slice of venison pasty disappeared quickly before him, and he was not quite so sparing of the ale as seemed consistent with his previously expressed resolutions of temperance. In vain Parson Dewhurst filled the goblet with water, and looked significantly at him. He would not take the hint, and turned a deaf ear to the admonitory cough of Sir Ralph. He had little help from the others, for Richard ate sparingly, and Master Potts made a very poor figure beside him. At length, having cleared his plate, emptied his cup, and wiped his lips, the squire arose, and said he must bid adieu to his wife, and should then be ready to attend them. While he quitted the hall for this purpose, Mistress Nutter entered it. She looked paler than ever, and her eyes seemed larger, darker, and brighter. Nicholas shuddered slightly as she approached, and even Potts felt a thrill of apprehension pass through his frame. He scarcely indeed ventured a look at her, for he dreaded her mysterious power, and feared she could fathom the designs he secretly entertained against her. 
but she took no notice whatever of him. Acknowledging Sir Ralph's salutation, she motioned Richard to follow her to the further end of the room. "'Your sister is very ill, Richard,' she said as the young man attended her, "'feverish and almost light-headed. Adam Whitworth has told you I know that she was imprudent enough in company with Alison to visit the ruins of the conventual church late last night, and she there sustained some fright which has produced a great shock upon her system. When found, she was fainting, and though I have taken every care of her, she still continues much excited and rambles strangely. You will be surprised as well as grieved when I tell you that she charges Alison with having bewitched her. "'How, madam?' cried Richard. "'Alison bewitch her? It is impossible.' "'You are right, Richard.' replied Mistress Nutter, the thing is impossible, but the accusation will find easy credence among the superstitious household here, and may be highly prejudicial, if not fatal, to poor Alison. It is most unlucky she should have gone out in this way, for the circumstance cannot be explained, and in itself serves to throw suspicion upon her. "'I must see Dorothy before I go,' said Richard. "'Perhaps I may be able to soothe her.' "'It was for that end I came hither,' replied Mistress Nutter. "'But I thought it well you should be prepared. Now come with me.' Upon this they left the hall together, and proceeded to the abbot's chamber, where Dorothy was lodged. Richard was greatly shocked at the sight of his sister. So utterly changed was she from the blithe being of yesterday, then so full of health and happiness. Her cheeks burnt with fever, her eyes were unnaturally bright, and her fair hair hung about her face in disorder. She kept fast hold of Alison, who stood beside her. "'Ah, oh, Richard!' she cried on seeing him. "'I am glad you are come. You will persuade this girl to restore me to reason, to free me from the terrors that beset me. She can do so if she will.' "'Calm yourself, dear sister.' said Richard, gently endeavouring to free Alison from her grasp. "'No, do not take her from me,' said Dorothy wildly. "'I am better when she is near me, much better. My brow does not throb so violently, and my limbs are not twisted so painfully. Do you know what ails me, Richard?' "'You have caught cold from wandering out indiscreetly last night,' said Richard. "'I am bewitched,' rejoined Dorothy in tones that pierced her brother's brain. "'Bewitched by Alison Device, by your love! <laughs> she wishes to kill me, Richard, because she thinks I am in her way, but you will not let her do it.' "'You are mistaken, dear Dorothy. She means you no harm,' said Richard. "'Heaven knows how much I grieve for her, and how fondly I love her,' exclaimed Alison tearfully. "'It is false,' cried Dorothy. "'She will tell a different tale when you are gone.' "'She is a witch, and you shall never marry her, Richard, never, never!' Mistress Nutter, who stood at a little distance, anxiously observing what was passing, waved her hand several times towards the sufferer, but without effect. "'I have no influence over her,' she muttered. "'She is really bewitched. I must find other means to quieten her.' Though both greatly distressed, Alison and Richard redoubled their attentions to the poor sufferer. For a few moments she remained quiet, but with her eyes constantly fixed on Alison, and then said quickly and fiercely, "'I have been told if you scratch one who has bewitched you till you draw blood, you will be cured. I will plunge my nails into her flesh.' "'I will not oppose you,' replied Alison gently. "'Tear my flesh if you will. You should have my life's blood if it would cure you.' But if the success of the experiment depends on my having bewitched you, it will assuredly fail. Oh, this is dreadful, interposed Richard. Leave her, Alison, I entreat of you. She will do you an injury. I care not, replied the young maid. I will stay by her till she voluntarily releases me. The almost tigress fury with which Dorothy had seized upon the unresisting girl here suddenly deserted her, and sobbing hysterically she fell upon her neck. Oh, with what delight Alison pressed her to her bosom! "'Dorothy, dear Dorothy!' she cried. "'Alison, dear Alison!' responded Dorothy. "'Oh, how could I suspect you of any ill design against me?' "'She is no witch, dear sister, be assured of that,' said Richard. "'Oh, 
"'Oh, no, no, I, I'm quite sure she's not,' cried Dorothy, kissing her affectionately. This change had been wrought by the low-breathed spells of Mistress Nutter. "'The access is over,' she mentally ejaculated. "'But I must get him away before the fit returns. "'You had better go now, Richard,' she added aloud, and touching his arm. "'I will answer for your sister's restoration. "'An opiate will produce sleep, and, if possible, she shall return to Middleton to-day.' "'If I go, Alison must go with me.' said Dorothy. "'Very well. I will not thwart your desires,' rejoined Mistress Nutter, and she made a sign to Richard to depart. The young man pressed his sister's hand, bade a tender farewell to Alison, and, infinitely relieved by the improvement which had taken place in the former, and which he firmly believed would speedily lead to her entire restoration, descended to the entrance-hall, where he found Sir Ralph and Parson Dewhurst, who told him that Nicholas and Potts were in the courtyard, and impatient to set out. Shouts of laughter saluted the ears of the trio as they descended the steps. The cause of the merriment was speedily explained when they looked towards the stables, and beheld Potts, struggling for mastery with a stout Welsh pony, who showed every disposition, by plunging, kicking, and rearing, to remove him from his seat, though without success, for the attorney was not quite such a contemptible horseman as might be imagined. A wicked-looking little fellow was Flint, with a rough, rusty black coat, a thick tail that swept the ground, a mane to match, and an eye of mixed fire and cunning. When brought forth, he had allowed Potts to mount him quietly enough, but no sooner was the attorney comfortably in position than he was served with a notice of ejectment. Down went Flint's head, and up went his heels, while on the next instant he was rearing aloft, with his forefeet beating the air, so nearly perpendicular that the chances seemed in favour of his coming down on his back. Then he whirled suddenly round, shook himself violently, threatened to roll over, and performed antics of the most extraordinary kind, to the dismay of his rider, but to the infinite amusement of the spectators, who were ready to split their sides with laughter. Indeed, tears fairly streamed down the squire's cheeks. However, when Sir Ralph appeared, it was thought desirable to put an end to the fun, and Peter the groom advanced to seize the restive little animal's bridle, but eluding the grasp, Flint started off at a full gallop, and accompanied by the two bloodhounds, careered round the courtyard as if running in a ring. Vainly did poor Potts tug at the bridle. Flint, having the bit firmly between his teeth, defied his utmost efforts. Away he went, with the hounds at his heels, as if, said Nicholas, the devil were behind him. Though annoyed and angry, Sir Ralph could not help laughing at the ridiculous scene, and even a smile crossed Parson Dewhurst's grave countenance, as Flint and his rider scampered madly past them. Sir Ralph called to the grooms, and attempts were instantly made to check the furious pony's career, but he baffled them all, swerving suddenly round, when an endeavour was made to intercept him, leaping over any trifling obstacle, and occasionally charging any one who stood in his path. What with the grooms running hither and thither, vociferating and swearing, the barking and springing of the hounds, the yelping of lesser dogs, and the screaming of poultry, the whole yard was in a state of uproar and confusion. "'Flint mun be possessed!' cried Peter. "'I never seen him go on in this way before.' I noticed Elizabeth Device near the stables last night, and I shouldn't have wonder if her had bewitched him. No doubt on't, replied another groom. Howsoever we mun contrive to catch him, or Sir Ralph will send us all about our business. Oh, I wish you'd contrive to do it then, Tom Lomax, replied Peter, but I'm barely blowed. Dang me if I ever seed such air go bad work in my born days. "'What's to be done, squire?' he added to Nicholas. Oh, "'The devil only knows,' replied the latter. "'But it seems we must wait until the little rascal chooses to stop.' This occurred sooner than was expected. Thinking possibly that he had done enough to induce Master Potts to give up all idea of riding him, Flint suddenly slackened his pace, and trotted as if nothing had happened to the stable door. But, if he had formed any such notion as the above, he was deceived, for the attorney, who was quite as obstinate and wilful as himself, and who through all his perils had managed to maintain his seat, was resolved not to abandon it, 
and positively refused to dismount when urged to do so by Nicholas and the grooms. "'He will go quietly enough now, I dare say,' observed Potts, "'and if not, and if you will lend me a hunting-whip, I will undertake to cure him of his tricks.' Flint seemed to understand what was said, for he laid back his ears as if meditating more mischief, but being surrounded by the grooms he deemed it advisable to postpone the effort to a more convenient opportunity. In compliance with his request a heavy hunting-whip was handed to Potts, and armed with this formidable weapon the little attorney quite longed for an opportunity of effacing his disgrace. Meanwhile Sir Ralph had come up and ordered a steady horse out for him, but Master Potts adhered to his resolution, and Flint remaining perfectly quiet, the baronet let him have his own way. Soon after this, Nicholas and Richard, having mounted their steeds, the party set forth. As they were passing through the gateway, which had been thrown wide open by Ned Huddleston, they were joined by Simon Sparshot, who had been engaged by Potts to attend him on the expedition in his capacity of constable. Simon was mounted on a mule, and brought word that Master Roger Nowell begged that they would ride round by Reed Hall, where he would be ready to accompany them, as he wished to be present at the perambulation of the boundaries. Assenting to the arrangement, the party set forth in that direction, Richard and Nicholas riding a little in advance of the others. End of chapter 1